Um, first, before my talk, just a quick announce. Uh, we found a camera. So if you think it's yours, you just need to ask to the organization. And of course, we will ask for a proof, like uh, which photo is inside or something like that. Uh, we are not so stupid. Um, so the talk. Um, I will talk about uh, Burp Suite, which is a well-known um, proxy used for offensive uh, purposes. And first, uh, who I am. Uh, I have a security company, which is very small. I'm the only one employee. Uh, I'm doing a lot of... <laughs> yes, I'm the boss. Uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, penetration testing, mostly related to web application, web services, web blah, blah, blah. And um, I'm not affiliated at all with Portswigger as a guy or as a company, uh, but I love uh, uh, their products. I have used uh, Bob Suite for years and other proxies before I'm doing this kind of stuff for something like uh, 13 years already. And I have a few warnings. Uh, first, this is not a talk about uh, methodologies. So I will not explain how to do the recon phase and then looking for this and that. Uh, you have some very nice books on the subject. Uh, you have the chapter 21 of the web application acronym book. Everybody should uh, read it at least um, 10 times. And it's not a uh, burp 101. So if you have no clue about what a uh, burp suite is, uh, I'm sorry for you, but uh, you will not uh, fully get the value of this talk. And um, finally, everything was tested on version 1.5.11, which is not the la latest one because he released one just last week. And, but it should work perfectly fine on the latest version. Um, how to compare? <laughs> to other products. Uh, in fact, I don't care. Um, Burp Free is too late uh, related to Burp Pro. And um, Zap is open source. It's from the OWASP project. Um, there's too many functional bugs for me to use it in uh, professional engagements. So I will stick to Burp Pro, which is my tool of choice and where I invested uh, in my training and everything. So. Sorry, but there is no clear comparison, web service here, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just you need to know that everything which is added to Zap and which is not in Burp Pro, we are a few guys doing some lobbying on Burp forums, and we usually get the features uh, weeks or a month later. So uh, I have no good reason to switch uh, to something else. So that's the point that we will cover. I have something like 100, 100 slides, uh, so I will probably be a little quick. I mean fast. So data, vi data visualization. Uh, we will have a lot of different formats during uh, engagements, depending on the underlying technologies, for example. And you have a lot of uh, formats supported by default and some other support supported via extensions. Oh, this is very basic. This is uh, the classic uh, re request. You have some uh, get parameters here. You have some post parameters. And you have some cookies. So it's uh, exactly the GPC thing like in PHP, get post cookie. And this is not very readable. And if you want to switch something from post to cookie, for example, you will need to take care of encoding. And if you switch to get, you have URL encoding to apply, etc. So uh, you just switch to the params tab. And everything is much more readable. And if you click on cookie, you have a small pop-up, and you can switch to get, for example. And it will transform to a get parameter with the proper encoding and everything. So it's very easy. And it's very easy also to remove several parameters without looking for the, the semicolon uh, that you will miss. Uh, so it's very uh, practical. Uh, this is XML, so I do a lot of XML-related stuff, as you may know. Uh, this is unreadable. And you have this uh, tab, which will do some very uh, basic uh, presentation, like uh, um, tabulation and everything. 
AMF. This is uh, action uh, messaging format, or I think. This is related to Flash applications, and you can have uh, some Python uh, scripts doing that too. Okay. If you could uh, shut down your phone, it, it would be cool. And uh, so AMF is a mix between uh, binary uh, data and uh, the clear text string. So it's somewhat readable, but you have no clue about what, it, what is. Uh, it's a string, it's an uh, object description. And you have the AMF tab, which will do something very nice. And you have, uh, so this is a very simple example, but if you have complex objects, uh, you have all the um, detail of the object, and this is very easy to read. Uh, view state, if you are in Windows technologies, <laughs> okay, this is, this is a real life uh, view state. Uh, so it's that huge. And this is uh, still huge, but it's more readable. You have some detail on the kind of value, and you have still some binary here and there, but uh, it's better. OK, so that's by default. And of course, <clears throat> if you have some specific needs, for example, you have a protocol which, which was designed for this specific application, it's impossible to find uh, the format supported uh, by Burp, so you can do that via extensions, and it's very simple. I mean, uh, I will show you later. So if you have uh, JSON data, so this is from the uh, uh, Twitter API, which was just shut down uh, 10, 10 days ago, and um, so you have some JSON data, and you, you just need to use the extension, and it's uh, very readable. And here it's um, sorted as you can see, and so that's the kind of feature you can easily uh, activate or not. Do you want it to be sorted because you, it's easier to read, or do you want to be uh, unsorted because it's what is used by the application? So that's very easy to do. And um, as you can see, this is the only line of the world extension which is related to its functionality. Everything else is creating uh, buttons or uh, binding action to buttons and everything. So you just need a template that you, you can reuse. And you have just, if you are doing a Python uh, extension, you just have this line and everything which is supported uh, by default in Python. It's just one line to have your own extension supporting this format. So it's very uh, interesting. And so if you have this kind of need, just uh, use uh, this extension as a template and just modify the few uh, lines related to functionality. Uh, we have more and more JavaScript. Everybody try to obfuscate their JavaScript code just to make us harder the job of looking for DOM XSS, I think so. And so this is a unreadable. And we have uh, two extensions uh, dealing with uh, JavaScript. Uh, both of them are using code from uh, the well-known uh, gsbotifier.org. Um, but the first one is using Java to call Reno to call JavaScript in order to call the JavaScript API. API. Uh, so it's not very uh, elegant. And the second one is a Python extension, which we'll call the Python library. So it's very, very clean. And that's the kind of output you will get. So it's, so that's the default version. And that's the readable version. So uh, if you are spending your full days in this kind of stuff, you clearly uh, will um, be more productive uh, in the long run if you see this kind of content and you don't need to think too much to looking to where uh, will this variable start and stop and everything, it's very easy. Okay, uh, last one, this is protobuf, which is a Google protocol. <coughs> it's used in a lot of their applications, um, like Google Talk, I think. And uh, this extension allows to decode every protobuf messages. And if you provide a dot .proto file, which is uh, something like the grammar, and then you can do some tampering uh, via the extension. So if you are uh, in this kind of stuff, 
it could be interesting. This is the only thing I didn't test because I have never uh, met any protobuf application in real life, and I didn't want to set up the, all the all the needed um, things just to take a screenshot. So this is not my screenshot. This is the only one. Okay, that's for data visualization. Uh, no. So what time is it? Okay. GUI navigation. So um, it's a, um, a GUI tool, so you have a lot of tabulation with a lot of fields and everything, and you spend your day inside that. And so a few tricks. Uh, contextual buttons. You have every, everywhere in the application, you have two kinds of buttons. This, is one, this one is a documentation, this one is a restore default, and they are contextual. So if you click here, you will have only the documentation related to temporary file location. And if you click here, you will only reset to the default value, um, the configuration option of this part. So it's very useful because if you have set up a lot of complicated things uh, everywhere in Burp for doing very complicated, uh, for brute forcing very complex application, for example. And then you need to go back to the default value for one uh, location, just click one button, and you're sure you will not mess uh, all your macro settings or whatever you are uh, tuning elsewhere. Um, and sometimes, of course, you have no default, so you have only the help uh, button. And if you have never pressed this button, you should try and read the wall content uh, a few times because uh, there's a lot of stuff in the, doc in the verb documentation, and you should really um, read it if you pay the license. I mean, you, you use some money, use some time also to, to be really efficient. Um, hotkeys, so I'm mainly a command line guy, so the mouse is um, mainly a way of losing time. And um, you have, uh, by default, uh, no, you have um, 90 actions which are defined and that can be uh, activated by a shortcut. By default, you have uh, perhaps uh, 30 uh, of these actions which are uh, configured. And so we will uh, have a quick overview. Uh, you have everything related to copy, past, and cut, so no, no, no mystery. Uh, you can do some uh, encoding and decoding for URL, HTML, and Base64 straight for your keyboard, so this is very efficient. It will start a pop-up with a decoded value. It's very, uh, it will not, I, I mean, not impact your workflow. Uh, it will not modify in place, so it's very, very well done. Um, Green navigation, you can switch from tab to tab uh, using control shift. And uh, my personal favorite is uh, issue repeater request. So it's not defined by default, <clears throat> but if you are in a repeater, you are typing to your keyboard in order to think to what you will do, and then you need to take the mouse, go to the go button, and go back to your text field to the next request. It's very uh, inefficient, and so you define this uh, shortcut, and you can keep uh, your focus on the text box, and control G uh, every time you need to test uh, this specific request. So this is very, very uh, useful, at least in my opinion. Okay. In Burp forums, uh, there's often the question like, uh, we, need, we need the auto-scroll in proxy story. I agree, but it is already there. In fact, uh, by default, um, your every request is added at the bottom of the proxy story because it's newer, uh, so you have no auto-scroll. You need to use your mouse and everything. And, but if you simply click here, you will uh, have the same information, but in reverse order. So every new request will pop up to the top of the history, and then you have auto scroll. And it's really easy, so uh, I have no demo for that. But as soon as some traffic go through the proxy, you see the line changing, and you have uh, exactly what is uh, needed for auto scroll. So it's very, uh, very easy and very stupid, but it works. So that's on the only thing I ask to, to my tools. Um, custom payloads. 
so by default, there are some payloads which, which are shipped with uh, Burp Pro. You have some default user agents, default username, default password, everything. Um, but sometimes you want to use some other lists and you can do load and go to an external uh, file and import an external file, but it's, it's something like three or four mouse clicks. It's way too much. Uh, so you just need to configure from the integer in through your menu, you go to each directory where you put your word list and you include them all. And then you can um, directly from the introduer, uh, introduer menu uh, access to your word list with only one click. And so the magic combo is something like the one from Burp, then Nikto, then uh, FuzzDB, then Dearbuster, and everything you need. You can add the RockU password list if you are in broad forcing password and everything. You do whatever you want. Uh, so you, you, you win uh, three clicks. This is cool. Oh, personalized scan. So this is uh, very few people know about uh, this one. Um, if you send a request to the scanner, it will automatically define the point where to inject a modified value. And so it's, it's well done, but uh, sometimes you do not, do not want or do not need the automatic features or in intelligence of the tool. And you just need to define yourself what you want. But you still want to use the scanner functionality, which is black box and which is well done. Uh, so, you send your request to Intruder, you define your payload as usual, as, you, as usual, and then right click and acti actively scan defi define insertion point, and this will use the scanner uh, logic applied only to this uh, specific uh, location. So you have everything you need, you have the perfect control on the location, and you are also um, uh, automatic power of scanner, which is working for you. Okay, managing state. Backups. Uh, automatic backups is useful. Why? Because if you are doing some serious hacking, uh, you, uh, I mean, I usually lost notion of time when doing this kind of stuff. Uh, so I will, of course, forgot to press the save state button and of course, my GVM will crash, and I will last a few hours of work, and so that's shitty. So in option MISC, you have uh, the automatic backup configuration. Just define. So every 30 minutes, I want to an auto backup. Uh, I want to store, to store in this folder, so files are timestamped, so you have no way to um, overwrite pre previous data. And of course, you need to, to check a backup on exit. This way, even if you are very, very tired and you close your bug by mistake, uh, you will still have your state, uh, which is um, right to the file and that you, you can reuse it later. Uh, save and restore are the classic um, companion of the automatic backup feature. Um, in fact, um, you can use it to export to your customers if your customers are advanced enough to have burp themselves. Uh, so it's very useful. You, you put all your proof of concept in repeater tabs, then, excuse me, then you export and then you send the file to the customer, which open in burp and he have, then give the, save the state, give to the engineers or pen testers, which will load it. And with, uh, and then they are forbidden to modify the scope. So it's something like a legal protection for the company, only the manager uh, defines the scope area and the pen testers are not allowed to modify it. So it's a, kind, uh, it's a way to use uh, this kind of functionality. Okay, um, actually um, saving information about extension is buggy, but uh, I opened a ticket uh, last week, so it will be fixed soon. So it is buggy right now, but uh, consider that you can also play with the uh, extension option. Okay. Oh, alors. so this is a few shortcuts. 
switching from get to post, so you find the XSS using get. Uh, question, is it exploitable using post? So you have two solutions, either you do it manually and you will forbid uh, something like a new line or spend 20 seconds thinking to how to do it. It's not efficient. So uh, just right click, change request method, and you have this get request and you will have this uh, post request. So everything, uh, about take care of everything. You have the content type, uh, either you have the content length with the right value, and if you need any specific encoding, I mean, if you, if you switch to post to get, uh, you will uh, it will also take care of the specific uh, URL encoding, so everything is perfect for you. And so you just need to think, I want to test the other way, get to post or post to get, and you do not need to think to how to do that, use the tool. Okay, uh, you want to run some external third-party tools which do not support um, uh, do not support uh, proxying, or you are using a thick client which does not support proxying, and of course you still want to use Burp, and so you define a listener which uh, have this option uh, checked, which is support invisible proxying. And then you instruct your tool, this is Kipfish, which does not support uh, proxy. Um, you scan your listener, and then the listener will take care of forwarding the content to the real target, and you have everything generated by the tool, which is uh, stored by Burp, and easy to search, easy to sort, everything. So it's very easy, and the same thing for SIG client, for example. If you want to do some interception because uh, you have a complex workflow and you want to modify a few requests, uh, this is the way to, to do it, uh, invisible proxying and working in Burp. Okay, uh, so you are doing a pen test, you have to write a report, and then you need to get some data out of Burp to your report. Uh, so you need to export some URL. So you have a functionality which is copy URL, but it's very basic. It works only with get request and with get parameters. So no cookies, no post body, uh, no, post body no specific headers, nothing. Uh, but you have an extension which is curl it and which will, which will generate um, curl command. Uh, which this is very similar to the recent uh, features added to Chrome Developer Tools that you can generate some curl commands. And of course, you can also, uh, also uh, import some URLs. So you have something in your browser, you, uh, you put in your buffer, go to burp, and pass as a request, and everything will be uh, defined from the URL with a um, um, default value for the user agent and things like that. So it's useful. And this is a sample. You have a post uh, request uh, with a cookie, so there's no way to use uh, to use uh, a copy URL to extract uh, this uh, information. So you send to the curl extension, and you have this command line. So if your customer does not do not uh, use Burp, you use uh, this functionality and you send every proof of concept as a curl command. So every, everybody can set up a bootable CD with Linux and uh, just need to pass this command and then you can, they can reproduce your findings. Okay. Alors, uh, so. Intruder payloads. I will not show every payload. There's a lot of them, just a few uh, which are not very well known. Uh, basic authentication, uh, opaque data, blah, blah, blah. So uh, basic authentication, it's very simple. It's uh, the old way to authenticate access to web applications. Uh, you have a header, you have a word, which is basic, and you have a base64 string. And so if you press a control match B, you have this kind of pop-up which will open, and your value and the decoded value, okay? Um, so I will probably not make friends with the next slide. Okay, uh, so if you look to blogs, uh, everybody is wrong. Um, you, the, the way to, to do that is either use a prefix or suffix functionality, 
So the prefix is admin colon, for example, or the, pref the suffix is a password or ABC123, and then you will break for the other part. And, or you use some precompiled lists that you will generate outside with your shell script or uh, something else. But we should have a way to do it better. So you have the custom iterator payload, which is exactly what we are looking for. If you look to the documentation, um, it defines eight different positions. Uh, each position is a list of items with an optional separator. That's, a, that's perfectly enough for breakfasting uh, HTTP basic authentication. And there's only one blog which was right. Uh, nobody knows this blog, but he, this guy read the verb documentation. Kudos. Okay, so that's a URL just to prove my points. And this is how to do it. Uh, you take your request, you highlight the base 64 string, and you define uh, one payload location. So, and then you have a custom iterator. You have two positions. One is the first one is a list of username with a colon in order to uh, separate from the password. The second position is a list of password. You have one, uh, so this is only one payload from a verb point of view, and so you can apply post-processing to a specific payload. So you apply a base 64 encoding, and uh, of course you should, uh, you should uncheck the payload encoding, which is checked by default, because if you don't do that, your equal characters will be encoded to percent three day, uh, and you have no way to find a valid password this way. And so this is the way to do it. And once that you understand how to, I mean the logic, the, log the logic behind uh, this way to do it, you can use some other way. Uh, you still have your custom iterator. First position is username. Then second position is one single string, which is colon. Then a list of passwords. Then a list of suffix. For example, uh, exclamation mark or some years or something else. And you keep your post-processing and encoding. And then you, you can get this kind of output which is generated uh, exactly with the previous um, way to do it. So you have your login, you have your password, and you have a suffix. And so in fact, you have four, four positions. One, two for the colon, three for the password, and four for the suffix. Opaque data. So in a pen test, you met this uh, request. So you have uh, something, it's profile.php, you have a parameter, its name is auth, mm, interesting, and then you have a huge blob of data. And then you have an answer which looks like you are authenticated on the application. So it's surprising. It's surprising because you have no cookies. So how could you be authenticated into the application if you have no cookies? There's a few possibilities. Either the token, I mean this one, is your cookie, but it's not in the cookie, it's in the get parameters. This is unsafe because of uh, the referrer and everything, but you know, you should not store a session ID in get parameters. Second solution, it's an anti-cache mechanism, just, uh, you see, like in uh, Ajax application. But you should not be authenticated. Or third solution, this is authentication data. And this became to be interesting. Is it checked server side? If it is, it's okay. And if it's not, you have a big problem. So from the documentation, you have a payload which will six, six cycles through a base string, one character at a time, incrementing the ASCII code of that character by one. So it's very simple, but it's very powerful. So we use, uh, we'll, we highlight this huge block of data. We'll define the payload type at, as character from her and then run. And you will get some strange output. So this is uh, extracted from the response using, using a grep extract from the introduer options. And you will see that the name of your application will change. And then later the UID of the user will change and later the GID, et cetera, et cetera. So this is surprising. We are logged with UID egal 
uh, 600 and previously, previously it was 100. So clearly this is encrypted data. Uh, this is either XOR or uh, ECB. It couldn't be CBC uh, because we, we um, oh, it's crypto, but uh, if it's CBC, when you modify the first set, we should modify the second one. And here we modify one value each time, so it's not CBC. And we know which part of the string which will modify the UID value. And so let's try to play on this specific portion of the string at the bit level. So this is, uh, so we identify that this part is related to the UID. And now we use bit flipper. And we define the eight uh, position of each bit uh, of a byte. And then we rerun the tool. And we see a lot of strange value, and this one is interesting. So now we have UID 0, 0, 0, 0, and it's well done. But uh, so this is uh, from my um, a training uh, I do, and this, oh, I have a lot of exercise, and you get this one. So you, you didn't win a flag. It's well done, but you need UID 000 and GID 000, so you can do it further and better, but that's not the point. The point is just to show that using character forber and then bit flipper, you can go from a huge block of data to a specific point, uh, which is related to the functionality. And last one, uh, CSRF tokens. So it's, it's a mess for brute forcing and using intruder and using the scanner and everything. And so uh, we have an application which take uh, two parameters token and value, token is a long value, as you can see, and value is one. And if we submit this form, we get that an information that the token is not valid, and we get the value of a valid token. I mean, I, I suppose it's a valid token, but it should be. And if, so it, it's 9CA, blah, blah, blah. Then we use 9CA as a token, and it says that the token is valid, and then we get another value, which is 22222, and then we use 22222, and we get B34, uh, B43, etc., etc. If you need to do that uh, manually, it's stupid. Uh, you will spend your time uh, cut, uh, copying and pasting a valid session ID in repeater. It's exactly what you should not do. So recursive grep to the rescue. Uh, from the documentation, it will extract a portion from the previous request and use it in the current request. So you get the token and you use it in your next request. That's exactly what we want to do. So uh, Pitchfork, which is a way to use uh, different payloads. The first, uh, no, first. The second payload needs a parameter value. That's what you want to test from your penetration testing point of view. And you will try uh, from 0 to 50. Why not? <laughs> and here you will define your anti-CSRF um, payload. So you define a parameter, which is token, which you will use rec recursive grep. And then here you put a valid token for the initial uh, step and every other step will use the value extracted by a regular expression from the previous request. And it works perfectly well. And I, am, I may have a demo depending. Mm. I, I may do a demo later at the end if I still have some time or if uh, I'm too late, I could do it later. I mean, I want a beer or something. So, uh, problems. Uh, this only works if the token is inserted in the result page. So if you have a formulaire, uh, a form which um, doing the um, presenting the form and uh, displaying the results, this is the right uh, scenario to use uh, this kind of string, this kind of uh, mechanism. And you can, you must use only one thread. Because if you use one, one, uh, more than one thread, uh, you will kill your token uh, as, short, uh, as soon as you fetch it, so it will not work. But this is uh, similar if you use a macro-based solution in order, in order to bypass uh, this kind of tokens. But this solution is twice faster 
than a uh, macro based uh, counterpart. So I just did some benchmark um, just a few hours ago. And um, depending on how you set up your macro, you could be uh, two or three times slow, slower than using a recursive grep. So it's really um, um, interesting to use this kind of stuff. And plus, uh, a lot of guys are afraid of macros. So that's a way to bring forth uh, CRSF protected forms without using macros. And that's the output. So uh, as you can see, we extract some values here, and we use them as the next uh, uh, request. So that's exactly what we are looking for. And then somewhere you will hit the value 33, and then you will win a flag. So uh, you win, and you need to go to the next step. So uh, I have a demo, but maybe later. Mobile applications. Uh, mobile applications. We have more and more mobile applications to test. And a few tricks. Uh, Traffic redirection, so you are using, uh, for example, um, Android smartphone, which is rooted, and you still want to use your usual workflow and toolbox. So you set, an, uh, you set up a proxy listener, which is listening on a public interface. Uh, I mean public uh, on your testing network, not public on the internet, which could be dangerous. If, you, if people can access your burp, uh, burp listener, it's not a good thing for you. Uh, okay, read the documentation, it's explained. Uh, so you install uh, the application, which is proxy droid, and you configure to redirect to your burp, in burp instance. And you can use app specific or global uh, proxy proxying to burp. And do not forget to check uh, GNS proxy, which is not checked by default, but, but which will be useful uh, later. So that's uh, listening on, on all interfaces, including the uh, LAN one. And this is a proxy droid. Oh, sorry, it's in French, in for people not reading French. Um, so that's a browser. So you will do uh, app-specific proxying. You will proxy the browser, and you will redirect to your remote uh, burp uh, instance. And the um, DNS option is somewhat lower, but you need to check it. And then you see this kind of request in your burp proxy, so it's, uh, it's from the smartphone, and so you, you hit your goal, you, you have uh, every traffic com coming from the smartphone to your burp instance and going to the target uh, application. And uh, that's why it's useful to check the DNS prox proxy option. If you, if you are resolving DNS via your proxy and that your proxy is burp, you can use some specific uh, built-in uh, request, uh, HTTP burp. And for example, you can um, browse your proxy history uh, from uh, the outside using uh, this kind of URL. And so it's exactly the same request here and there. And that's, that's one of the risks, but not the most dangerous one, of exposing your burp listeners to the outside world. OK. So mobile applications are using SSL, which is a good thing, uh, but which is not very good for, new, for us, because we are doing some brute forcing. And um, so we, we, can, we get this kind of uh, behavior. We have a website, but uh, we have a red uh, cross. This is not a good thing. And if you want to start a Google Play or Google Store or Play Store, uh, this is Play Store, uh, it will not load because it will verify the certificate, and the certificate is not good. So no way to um, debug uh, your connection to Play Store. So. Um, every burp installation comes with its own uh, certificate authority, so do not use the certificate from some, somebody else, use your own. And you can uh, go to your proxy listener options and export in there, so if you are through the, the GUI, but you will get a file on your testing machine. Or you can uh, use uh, your browser if you are doing a DNS um, proxying, you just need to 
it this URL and you will download the BERP CA certificate. So it's a very convenient way to uh, bring the certificate to your mo mobile device. Uh, then you rename from there to CRT, so no need for any complicated OpenSSL command. I never remember uh, this uh, tricky commands. I already need to have a Google uh, way helping me. And then, depending on your Android version, you can just touch the file or you can go to parameter security install from SD card and then you have is your burp cert uh, certificate which is included in the recognized authority and then you get uh, this kind of behavior so you can debug uh, Google Play and you can uh, have your SIG application which is happy with the certificate. And this is the first request you get when opening Google Play so you can spend your time diving in what is possible and what is not in this kind of uh, online web store. But it's forbidden. Okay. How much time? Ouch. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, faster. Uh, by default, some browsers do not have some built-in developer tools, which is a shame. Uh, for example, iPhone and iPad. Uh, I don't care. Exactly, except when I'm looking for, for XSS. So uh, Firebug have a version which is Firebug Lite, which is JavaScript only. And so you can load it in your browser and uh, use the start open egal true option. And uh, then you will have a Firebug in every uh, browser, including uh, your iPad. Um, it seems a good idea to use uh, the match and replace functionality, but it will not work because uh, Firebug Lite itself will include the head uh, tag that you will use as your marker, so you will have an infinite loop. This is not uh, what you are looking for. Uh, but I have uh, coded a very small extension, which is a JavaScript injector, and that you can use to do a few things, like uh, um, starting uh, Firebug Lite, uh, but also it works well with BIF, which is a XSS framework, or Autopon from Metasploit. If you can uh, man in the middle your client, for example, in an internal penetration testing team uh, test, when you are playing RP or GNS or WPAD uh, tricks in order to proxy to to man in the middle some clients. And uh, okay, so that's um, a bro mobile browser, and then this is Akin Paris website, and I have a Firebug Lite which is loaded, and so I can inspect the DOM and looking for my cross scripting uh, strings and everything. Extensions. So, as uh, a few resources related to extensions, um, you should read everything before coding your own. Um, so, Extension which could be useful, e uh, external formats, uh, we see this one, uh, WCF, uh, WSL, you can generate a request from your own WSL file, which is a, a feature which, which that we are waiting for long, but it's available through an extension. You can use some external tools. Um, you can um, drive a SQL map from Burp, for example. Uh, you can um, a few things like uh, Burp's notes, which allow to take notes inside Burp. So if, if, for example, your customer allows you to only have uh, one jar uh, to bring to their testing machine, you can have one jar and have everything, including a way to take notes. Um, uh, custom logger, it's very, very useful if you want to debug uh, your extensions. Uh, I, I wrote a few ones. Um, so HTTP crossword is in order to identify reverse proxies. Uh, I wrote a command line tool, something like, mm, I don't know, last, uh, I published it maybe last year or the year before. Uh, Nmap includes the functionality from my script but it's very badly done. The logic is wrong and everything. Uh, but if you are in Burp, you have everything, your user agent, which could be very specific. Only this kind of mobile smartphone can use this feature. And then you have all the details working from Burp, and you, you use this extension to add one header, which is the max forward header, and 
most of the job is analyzing uh, responses in order to identify uh, if a web service, if a reverse proxy was found or not. Uh, okay, so I think it's better to use uh, the burp extension than the command line tool than the nmap script uh, if you have a burp license, of course. Okay, that's the kind of output. Uh, so it's interesting because I provide the extension, but Burp still provides all the um, interface, the way to generate uh, your report, and you can also use a comparer to see from your own, uh, uh, make your own decision or if the tool is right or wrong uh, regarding the fact, the fact that a uh, reverse proxy was found. So this is generating a, a sub request from a WSDL. This is taking notes in Burp. Uh, now with a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet. Uh, this is a uh, free text, and this is uh, CSV-like. Um, voilà. That's for users. For developers, uh, a few points. You have three ways to write uh, Java um, Burp's extensions. Java, which is uh, the best way to do it if you like Java. I do not like Java. Uh, so Python, um, my personal choice because I'm fast using Python, but beware, Python is not JITON. So if you are, uh, even if you are um, um, experienced uh, coder in Python, you will have some problem uh, using the Java API. And Ruby, you have the same uh, drawbacks than Python, but I do not know Ruby, so I stick to Python. And this is the kind of problems that you will have if you play with Python. You have a Java API, and we choose some list of uh, array of integers, and then you will have to do this kind of trick, uh, like uh, using array.array, .array, and you can't use the built-in features of uh, Python. Uh, Python, so... Once you know it, it's not complicated, but you will find this kind of problem when writing your first extensions. Uh, if you are developing, you will need to, to quickly reload your extensions, and then if you click here, we control click, it will reload. So you will uh, unload and reload your extension uh, with only one click, so you don't need to unload, wait one second, click load, wait one second, it's way, uh, way easier. And this is custom logger, so this is the only way I know to see every traffic generated by Burp, event spider, scanner, and extensions. Um, so if you are doing some serious debugging, <laughs> it's mandatory. Please note that if you are debugging macros, you have a specific tools for macros. Macros nice uh, way to switch. Um, so just uh, macros are quite complicated to introduce, so I have just a demo. And I hope I have enough time. I hope so. Pas trop, no, no. <laughs> so the answer is so-so. Um, so I will just give a teaser right now, and if you are interested, come, come back la uh, later and elsewhere. So we have an application which needs authentication, uh, uh, login and password. Uh, the sessions are lasting for 15 seconds. And you have a form that you need to brought forth. So uh, you want to use uh, your usual way, uh, usual tools like repeater, intruder, and scanner. And this is very easy to do. And you could add that the form is protected by anti-CSRF token, and it's still doable. Everything is doable. And so that's how um, the application work. You have a login form, which displays the formula, the form if uh, it's a get uh, request, which processes the form if it's a post request, very easy username and password. And you have another page, which is your target, and which will uh, propose a form. And the value you need to find to get the flag is between one and 100. And so every 15 seconds, uh, you have your session which is invalidated and you need to log in back and go uh, resume your testing. 
so this is a debugger uh, specific to extensions to macro. It's very, very useful, but it's very uh, resources hungry. So just activate it when you need to debug your extension, your macro, but not when you will run them on a large scale. And you get this kind of content. So this is related to my demo. Um, I check if the session is valid, the session is invalid. So I will log as user 43 and I will um, get the cookie, uh, the, the new authenticated cookie. I will add it to my macro request and issue my request. And so, uh, for example, it means that you are in repeater and you can just focus on the value you want to submit and everything is uh, all the authentication and cookie and all this stuff, CSRF, is uh, delegated to the macro and you just need to focus to your functional target, which is this form with value from one to 100. It should be less than two minutes to do. Okay, and so uh, no macro, no demo, I mean. And this is the end of the talk. And uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, you are welcome now or later. Thank you. Question? Coming, coming, coming. Uh, could you talk briefly about the scanner vulnerability function of uh, Bird? What's my opinion regarding the scanner functionality? Yeah. Oh. I think it's the main difference between the pro version and the free version. Mm, oh, okay. Um, there's more difference than that. I mean, from a functional point of view, uh, it's already sufficient to switch to the pro version. Uh, you have a non-time limitation on the intruder features, for example, which is uh, you have some limitation in the free version. And regarding the scanner functionality, I usually use it, but do not rely on it too much. I mean, sometimes bugs are too complicated or not technical bugs, but logic bugs, there's no way the scanner will find it. But it's still, uh, I mean, for 300 uh, euros a year, it's still uh, interesting to get this uh, sent to scanner and get this job done. It already find a few uh, SQL injection or um, XSS I missed manually. So because I didn't spend so much time, it was user application and short um, um, engagement. So it's not a silver bullet, so I still rely on my own work, but it's useful. Another question? Thank you.